world. There's one country, though, that truly stands out, and that is Israel. If you go to the Middle East looking for oil, you don't need to stop in Israel. <laughs> but if you go looking for brains, for energy, for integrity, you know, it's the only stop you need to make in the Middle East. Israel has this intense penchant for constantly questioning and debating and challenging, which is essential for any innovation-based economy. Dan Senor is co-author of Startup Nation, Israel's Economic Miracle. Some of the factors that have been key to Israel's economic success, the role of the military. Almost every single Israeli goes through a leadership experience at a very young age. They're taught at age 18, 19, 20 years old what it means to lead, what it means to improvise, what it means to be entrepreneurial, albeit out in the battlefield. Civilian R&D spending. Israel spends the highest percentage of its economy compared to any country in the world on R&D. Israel has cutting-edge policies on immigration and assimilation. There are over 70 nationalities represented in Israel. The rapid integration of these immigrants through an aggressive Hebrew language immersion program has ensured they participate in Israel's innovation. If you look at the Soviet wave of immigration, 750,000, tens of thousands of those had these remarkable degrees in mathematics and science. It was just a huge influx of technological talent. This talent has fueled more startups than anywhere outside the Silicon Valley, bringing the world's leading corporations to Israel for their top R&D talent. And this economic engine has in turn strengthened the young nation. excited about tonight's program. Um, we're focusing on, the, on Israel as a, a high-tech leader, uh, and we have a very exciting program lined up, so we hope you enjoy it. Um, thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Israel Startup Nation program. You'll hear several experts describe some of the cutting-edge companies <coughs> that are changing the world. Right now, the future of technology is being developed in Israel. In fact, on February 16, 2017, the Global Investor Summit will take place in Jerusalem, where they're expecting over 5,000 innovators and venture capitalists, as well as more than 300 startups who will connect and demonstrate the latest in high tech. Here tonight, you'll get a chance to discuss this future and ask questions of our panel of experts. So, um, so, the first question is, uh, in the recent years, as we are pretty much uh, uh, just so right now, uh, the term of startup nation is showing up in a many contents and, and, and in many ways. Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, about the high-tech companies that involve in it, about the, length, the landscape, and can you shed some light about the phenomena and what are the factors contributing to that? In 2010, The Economist, which is one of the leading financial publications, came up with an astonishing statistics. It said that basically Israel is leading the world in number of startup companies and venture capital investments per population. Not only that, Israel has more startup companies, I'm sorry, more startup, startup companies are formed in Israel in one year than in all of France. Right. So, why, why is that? First of all, as the clip said, Israel is a startup. From the first immigration that came in in the early 1900s until today, they built from scratch a very nice place. I mean, not a bad job with all the good and the bad. Not a bad job at all. And a lot of it was starting from scratch in a country that lacks natural resources. Now, everybody here knows Golda Meir, right? So Dr. May said that Moses walked the desert for 40 years, and basically the only place he came to in the Middle East is a place that doesn't have oil. <laughs> so what do we do? Basically, either we do nothing or we innovate. Now, David Ben-Kurian, who is considered as the father of the Israeli clean tech industry, said that necessity is the mother of all inventions. So Israel has scorching sun, it has a lot of desert in it, so what do we do? We invade, invent the drip irrigation. Everybody here knows the drip irrigation, right? Drip irrigation revolutionized agriculture, not only in Israel, but in South Africa, 
in other places around the world. That we have a problem with natural water. Okay, either drink salt water or you desalinate them. And until recently, Israel had the largest desalination plant in the world. Now Qatar built the biggest, bigger one. But that's okay. <laughs> so, factor number two, as we heard here, is the military, is the army. And it has three important fun functions. First, the soldiers are young, right? But they are taught on, from a very young age to be mission-driven problem solvers with initiative, with intelligence, and criticism. Okay? You have to question <coughs> your commanders. You don't do it outside when you're on a mission. You do it after the mission is over. Secondly, the units. 8200, the units that Joel came from, those are units that specialize in computers, in intelligence, in code breaking. And a lot of the entrepreneurs come out of those units. Number three is the technology itself. Many Israeli companies basically use military technology. Now, why is that? In the 60s, I'm sure everybody knows, there was a weapons embargo on Israel. So Israel had to create military in industrial companies. Some of the technologies used by the military came and became civil technologies. Some few examples. Elsint. Elsint was a world leader in medical imaging. Technology came from the army. Iron Dome. Everybody here knows Iron Dome, right? That's not a big city. Given Imaging. People know about Given Imaging here? Nobody heard of Given Imaging. Excellent. Given Imaging is a public company and it's a world leader in medical technology. It's a pill that size. It has in it two cameras, a power source, and light. What do you do with it? You swallow it, and it travels to your intestines, making a video, helping doctors assess you know, the patient's situation. It's, it's a breakthrough, and that came from military technology. The person who developed this technology used to work for Rafael. Rafael is a big military contractor in Israel. Second, second factor that's contributing to all of that, as we heard before, is the Jewish culture. From studying the Talmud, you're used to questioning everything, you're used to debate, you're used to question things which are obvious, right? And for, for folks who are founders of startups and entrepreneurs, ask Joel, there are no rules, there are no conventions. Everything is open. Everything is questionable. On the contrary, you should question that. Otherwise, you don't in and innovate. Factor number three. The mass immigration from Russia really contributed to the high-tech scene in Israel. Even before that, some of the leading companies were formed by folks who came from the US and from Canada. But the immigration <coughs> from Russia brought scientists with high degrees who, who that was a massive brain power that came especially to the R&D centers that were built in Israel and to the various universities. Now, universities in Israel have special institutes that take technology that the university doesn't really want to use and spin them out into private companies. A lot of the scientists that came from Russia became entrepreneurs or worked for those companies. I, I think I'm number four, right? Fourth factor. The, the nature of the Israeli entrepreneur is that he's high growth entrepreneur. Somebody who's looking for a business which is scalable, something that can be sold worldwide by using his relative advantages. Now, as an entrepreneur, you know that in Israel there isn't a big industry, manufacturing industry. So hardware is probably not the way to go. So you go through the route where you do have some sort of an advantage, which is a software. In, I'll give you one example. In 2000, a bunch of four young kids came up with a company called Mirabilis. Anybody heard about Mirabilis? One, two, excellent. Mirabilis came up with a software called ICQ. Maybe that rings a bell? ICQ was the first instant messaging platform in the world. It, it's the mother and father of WhatsApp, of the tools Google use, of all those SMSs we use, not, not only this concept was unique, but it was one of the first major free softwares that was developed to people who didn't have to pay for it. Now, Mirabis was sold 
for about $400 million in uh, 2000. Doesn't sound a lot today, but it was a major M&A transaction for, for Israelis back then. Products produced with Israeli technology, really widespread, or is it just our you know, attempt convincing everybody else that how good we are, how important we are? I'll try to give an example from a different field. Everybody here knows about the BDS? Yes, that's what the next session is about. BDS. So, the BDS, one of their sales decided to form a website. Forming a website costs money, effort, it's not easy. There's one company that offers a unique platform for creation of website. It's called Wix. It's an Israeli company. For some reason, the PBS decided to use Wix as its platform to create its website. Now, if, if, if you think about it for just a second, if the BTS's goal is to boycott Israeli products, stop using your cell phones because the technology, the mobile chips, and the memory carrying device that was developed by M Systems, you should boycott that. Stop using your cell phones. You should definitely not use Microsoft because Microsoft is developing its Windows in Israel. You should not use Google because Google has an R&D center in Israel. You should not use Facebook because Facebook bought an Israeli company that was instrumental in, in basically implementing its, its mobile technology. So what you should do, you should use landlines, right, BDS, and you should print all your stuff in regular printers. Not digital printers, because that's Indigo and Cytex, invented back in the early 90s. So you should write your leaflets by hand. And if all that creates a big headache, don't use Advil, because that was also created. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, have, I have so many questions to ask you, but, but why, should, why should one explore investing in startup Israeli technology companies? Hi, thank you for uh, having us. Um, so I think Alex did a fantastic job of, um, of framing what's going on in Israel from a macro level. And I'll give you my perspective at, uh, and a little bit uh, more uh, from the market perspective. And, and I'll start with how I got interested in Israel because I wasn't focused on Israel uh, at all for most of my career. But I got a call from a friend of mine named Richard Hirsch. And, and Richard Hirsch is the um, chairman of the Israel um, Business uh, Development Corporation, which is Israel Bonds. So immediately I thought this is going to be an expensive call. Any of you have probably gotten calls from these guys, right? So he said, look, I, I'm not asking you to buy a bond, but I want you to join a trip to Israel. And what we're doing is creating a business delegation to bring guys like yourselves to uh, come and look at the country from a business perspective. I said, okay, I'll come and I'll, and I'll ask if I, if I can bring some friends as well. So, so about 20 of us went, and we did the, the tours. We sat with BB, and we sat with uh, the Google uh, operations, and we went down to Beersheba, and we saw the cyber uh, technology uh, uh, and what's being created there. And, and I left with my jaw hanging. I could not believe the level of innovation, the level of not just brains, but how these entrepreneurs were deploying their technology. It, it was amazing. So fast forward, we created a, an investment strategy to help, uh, help these companies grow and come to the US and to Europe. Um, one, uh, uh, a few things, a few observations, insights, if you will, that um, I think are relevant and will key in on what Alex talked about. The, the, the intellectual property is exceptionally valuable, and not just because of the technology that backs it, but really about how it was deployed. So um, these companies are getting bought up because of this unique IP. There's not six of them or 12 or, or 18 of these types of companies in the world, which is often what you have in Silicon Valley. A lot of Me Too copycats, there tends to be one. And you know, as evidenced by the fact that about 70 billion dollars in exits have happened since 99. So you have Honeywell and Tyco and um, Amazon buying up these Israeli companies pretty much as quickly as they can. And that's a bit of a problem because these, these companies tend to sell a bit early. Right? So for the most part, for many years, Israel companies would get to an offer of about 100 million dollars and they'd say, oh, that's it, we're done, we've hit a home run. But really, if they would have held on for another 18 months, they would have exited at, at about you know, maybe three, four, five times more. 
So now we're starting to see entrepreneurs holding out for a little bit longer uh, to play for the bigger exits. Um, it's not all roses, right? So let's let's call. Uh, I'll call attention to something that we see in the market, which is uh, the "I built it, of course they will come" mentality of Israelis. And no disrespect to Israelis present, but there is this sense that. Of course, everybody will come buy my product when I get to the U.S. It's the best. It's the best technology. It's really not how it works. Usually, it's the customer, uh, or it's the company that gets to the customer first and creates the smarter defenses in how they're going to market, how they're getting customers. And working with Israelis to explain that that is an enormous part of the puzzle, not just product, not just focus on technology, um, is something that we have a, a, we do a lot of work on, and, and we, we, we really have to um, explain uh, market dynamics to a degree. So a big part of the work we do after we invest is, is bring those companies into <coughs> channel partners and to uh, help them market and sell. So this is a big area where Israelis, I think, need to up their game, quite frankly. But the technology is bar none phenomenal. Um, Another uh, interesting, so, so I have a, a company which I'd like to show you, which, which I think exemplifies some of the, the innovation story. 50-50 as to whether we'll get the clip to play, but let's give it a shot. So while we're warming up, this is a, um, this is a technology that was uh, the, the invention was created at Hebrew University, which has a world-class machine vision uh, program. And the problem these guys set out to solve was basically the, um, the issue of, of video uh, surveillance footage. There's so much of it, billions of hours created a year, and only about one, two, three percent was being reviewed. How do you effectively review all of this video footage that's created with more and more and more being created as the, the cost of the technology decreases. So what these guys did was they said, look, let's create a tool for, uh, for, for security professionals who have to review footage and help them get through it much, much faster. So this, this software basically takes original footage, it identifies the background and the foreground, the individual pieces, and then it, it shows it all at the same time. All of these cars went by with maybe hours in between, and with manipulating the images, we can do all kinds of searching tools. We can show all the blue cars, all the red cars, and now we've watched hours of video footage in maybe 30 seconds, with missing nothing at uh, uh, you know missing no objects at all this technology is being used by the FBI we help catch the um, Boston Marathon bombers it's being used by the Statue of Liberty by Google see all of these images are being layered into um, a, 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 a video frame at the same time so you can literally watch hours of, of footage in minutes so what happens when you, if you're manipulating all of this, this video data, what you can do is create statistical information, and this is where the company is headed to next, providing hospitals, providing um, big enterprises, data with cities coming out, how many cars are, are traveling across this bridge, what paths are they taking, so you get to a place where you, you, you can make use of this, this is a heat map showing the, the red is more traffic, um, and, the, and, and traffic patterns. Now you can make use of this data that otherwise was just sitting stored um, nowhere or sitting on the servers. Thank you. Um, so we're active as investors. We're pretty bullish about what we're seeing in Israel. Um, pretty excited, um, not bringing Israeli companies over. Often the approaches are so unique that it takes uh, customers, Americans, and Europeans time to, to want to switch to be open to it. Um, you know, for instance, we're looking at a company now which we will invest in in all likelihood that is protecting data being sent uh, over the internet by breaking it up into random pieces and sending it at different times over multiple paths, kind of like if you took a paper and put it through a shredder and then 
took all those indiv individual pieces and sent them to different mailboxes in the country. And they all arrive at the, at the destination where they're assembled automatically and the user doesn't know any different. So this is a very, very unique technology, almost unbreakable from an encryption standpoint, but we need to educate the market on, uh, on this new innovation. So this is, a, this is some of the challenges, that's some of the, 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 the challenges with uh, some of the Israeli technology that we see, but um, we're very excited to continue to be in the market and uh, will remain so for quite a while. Thank you very much. Just one more question. Show me us a little bit of uh, information. How, how, how can one gain exposure to the ecosystem and take measures there? And uh, if you have some statistics about how many companies are really making it and how many are making it? Yeah, sure. Um, so there are, uh, if folks want to um, get involved uh, in the Israeli startup community, there's a few really good organizations out there that are making uh, the companies accessible to individuals. One is called R Crowd. Maybe some of you have heard of R Crowd or have been, uh, uh, you can go to rcrowd.com. Another is iAngels. Um, and these are companies that basically will match uh, folks like yourself with Israeli startups and you can see, you know, you can search for all kinds of different uh, companies there. So that's a very good way to get educated and maybe put a few dollars to work as well. Um, there are about 8,000 uh, companies in Israel, startups. About, I'd say 1,000 or so are formed each year, some, something in, in that neighborhood. Um, most do not survive. Um, I'd say about 70% uh, or so, maybe 60, 65% go under within the first three years. Um, and, and the sad thing is that it really has very little to do with the product or the technology. Uh, it's mostly, and this is the same with Silicon Valley as well, it's mostly management driven. So, uh, you know, companies that, uh, you know, if you're looking and you do get involved in looking at making investments in companies, pay, pay a lot of attention to the team and, and, and how they intend to go to market and sell and create distribution. Um, you know, don't uh, become too enamored with the uh, product and the technology alone. There are many options for uh, startup companies to raise money. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, remarketing? Uh, what exactly does it do, and how did you do? Started in the, in the basement in my apartment in uh, Ramat Hasharon in Israel. Like uh, four years ago, I uh, still remember like, sitting with my two partners, like, laughing, uh, thinking uh, like what will be next, like any other, uh, you know. Israeli who uh, 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 work for a uh, few years uh, in startup companies or other, you know, techno technological uh, company, and uh, our passion was uh, was really e-commerce. Like, we really like, you know, like everybody, you know, shopping online, shopping in general, uh, guys like Amazon, eBay. And like uh, Alex and Avi said, uh, I, I really like the, 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 the like, in Israel, you're kind of like a survivor. So <coughs> you, you don't give up. Uh, so we thought, like, how can we help those small businesses, you know, compete with the, with the giants? And the idea was, uh, you know, the, the only option is, like, to unite forces together. Like, helping those uh, small businesses to join force, forces, sorry, and, uh, and, and, together like have the, some competitive advantage over the big guys and another thing we uh, like we understood uh, was that these small businesses they don't compete each other anymore they all compete against the the, the big guys uh, so I don't know if you have a, a shoe store and another shoe store you don't compete each other anymore because if the customer ends up not buying in that shoe store, he probably uh, ends up buying at Amazon. And once you, once Amazon gets you, uh, that's it. That's the end of the story for the for the small businesses. So really, the idea was because we we came like me and my other partners came from uh, big data, uh, analytics, uh, algo trading background. We thought how we can like unite. Uh, uh, and and, and uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, 
join together all, all, all the data of all these small businesses together without, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, without really touching the data or being too, too much involved, but just, you know, looking at the, at the analytics and statistics and uh, helping them uh, together uh, somehow compete the, the, the big guys. And uh, what we did is actually starting to serve, give service to small businesses to market to their to their uh, customers by looking at aggregated data of uh, many small businesses together and it somehow worked <laughs> um, and more and more businesses actually join the service by you know giving their data in in, uh, in return to enjoy the data of all the others and we surprisingly uh, so that they didn't afraid to, to share their data. But the first question was, will a small business share their data uh, in, in return to get like more more uh, more data from the others? And they, they, uh, they actually said yes. Like all of them share their data and, and help each other. And it was like uh, I don't know, Hanukkah is coming. Uh, it's uh, you know. Uh, Saying Hebrew, all uh, of is all katan and Quranu or It's like everyone is like a small light, and together we are stronger. Um, and that's what we did. And now it's like after three and a half years, we really we served uh, thousands of small businesses, that helping each other together uh, to to sell more, to market. Uh, uh, in a more smart way to be more uh, uh, data driven and uh, it's all because those small businesses actually help each other <coughs> and share data. Thank you very much. And how is it, is it to move the small light from Israel to New York? <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> that's, a, that's another challenge. Um, I moved to, uh, to New Jersey uh, two years ago. With, uh, with all my family. So after we uh, raised money from US investors, actually we, we, we raised money from private investors, which is something which is very hard to, to, to do in Israel, by the way. In Israel we found it uh, 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 easier to, to, to uh, raise money from VCs or from professional, uh, professional investors like angel investors but find uh, private uh, investors uh, that will, we, we were looking for a million dollar uh, seed investment and a million dollar in Israel it's like almost four million shekels. So in Israel four million shekels is a lot of money to raise for, to, from, from private investors. Uh, here in the US, like I don't know, five, ten people together can easily, not easily, but you know, it's like people who, who can uh, invest like 50 or 100k it's not big money, so five, seven people together join as a you know as a small group can can easily uh, uh, bring it up to almost like a million dollars, and that's what we did. So we raised not we don't call it like smart money, but uh, uh, money from from investors here in the U.S. that are willing to help, that want to be involved, want to uh, to be. Uh, uh, to invest in an Israeli company, so for us it was kind of a win-win, perfect match. Uh, and our market is in the United States, like the moving here was like a, a, a smart move and, and like a, a must actually. Um, so I took everything, like my family, three kids and a dog, moved here. It wasn't uh, an easy uh, step, but you know, like um, after three, four months, it looks like you, you, you like, uh, like you were living here uh, for uh, all my life, uh, and, and the community is amazing. And uh, I live in Livingston, like it's almost an hour from here, but it's kind of like the same, same people, same, same community, and it's amazing that the, that the experience for me, like moving from Israel to here, it's like same, same. I feel. Totally at home. Um, Dan, Israeli companies that make the, the transition to the U.S. market, uh, what 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 really differentiate 
the winners from the losers? Um, we talked about, you know, there are maybe a thousand startups every year that start their work in Israel. Many of them don't make it. And the question is, what differentiates between the ones that are going to make it and the ones that are going to fold and disappear? Um, there are two main pillars, two main attributes that every company needs to have in order to, uh, to succeed. And actually, I'm not going to talk about those. Um, those two things are very basic. First of all, you've got to have a great technology. Um, you've got to disrupt a market that is uh, in a meaningful way. Um, so, for example, your company uh, in Israel, I actually visited that basement about four years ago, so I know, I know how it smells. <laughs> and, and, uh, and they have a tremendous technology. Okay, so you've got to have that. That's a basic uh, attribute for any company. And the other thing is obviously having the right people. Having a strong management team, having people that are very strong techno uh, technically, and without it, you're not going to make it in this business as well. Okay, so you've got to have these two attributes in order to, uh, to just get out of the gate. What I've seen in my career, and talking to a lot of people in, in the industry, in our ecosystem, is that the companies that make it, the companies that become winners, are the ones that form the right partnerships going forward. And Avi mentioned this uh, in, his, um, in his conversation. Um, not every dollar invested in a company is the same dollar. It sounds a bit weird. But uh, if, you, uh, if a company has the right investors backing it, it would make a major difference in the life of the company and what it can achieve. Um, these, the right investors would be able to open doors for you, to uh, get you to the right customers, and, and to, get, to get you an edge. The same thing goes for the type of service providers such as Alex, who works at a legal firm, and obviously he has a lot of experience and can have the right term sheet signed. But it's not just that. It's, it's not just the technical aspect of the uh, legal work. It's mainly the type of doors that Alex can open for you in comparison to a, uh, a small local uh, legal advisor that may not be able to provide that same type of service. And the same thing goes for uh, what we do in a CPA firm. It's not just uh, you know the accounting work that we do for you, but a startup in our shop would be would have an opportunity to be open to a lot more uh, investors, to a lot more customers, and so forth. So these three pillars are are, are the basics in order to make it in this business: the right technology, having the right people, and forming the right partnership. And if you're looking at investment opportunities, you're looking at Israeli companies. It's very easy to fall in love with the, uh, with the technology and to appreciate people that come from unique military um, uh, units and so forth. But it's also very important to ask the question, who are you forming relationships with? Who are the other investors in here? Who are you working in terms of the, the support service that the company has? The head of the company has to be open to outside advice. And the problem with most of them is they're so emotionally connected to their business that they don't listen to anybody else's ideas but their own. I don't know if you have found the same thing in working with your activities. Israelis? No, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, but, but just, just one thing. What, one thing I want to mention is that an entrepreneur has to be, first of all, driven in believing in what he does. Because unlike a consultant, a lawyer, an accountant, he's a risk taker. He's not averse to risk. He has to take risks. So he has to go to a certain way. What Avi and Dan spoke about is after you, you finish a certain stage, your product is ready from an R&D perspective. 
you have your vision. You know what your mission is, that it's the time to create your management group. You need head of sales, you need head of marketing. You cannot do everything by yourself. Right. And the people who recognize it and build the right team, as the gentleman mentioned, you have to look at the team. They have a better chance of succeeding. So we agree with everything you say. <laughs> How could this Israeli model be applied here in the United States, if at all? So it is. The model um, is being studied very, very carefully in Israel, and there are uh, government organizations and private sector and academic organizations like the IDC that are exporting that know-how to other countries. Singapore, for one, is is a, is a very good example, but also within the U.S. So, and, and what the researchers found is is to have a successful startup ecosystem, you need a few things. You need the entrepreneur, uh, you need academia, you need access to capital, and then uh, big companies in the mix. With those four elements, you have the spark that gets uh, created, which can create the fire. So Israel is actually working with many, many cities in the U.S. Uh, to uh, explain what they've done and how it's worked, as well as other countries. So this is in the works. So first of all, how do you get from a small startup to become a large corporation? And how do you keep the large corporation not to be owned maybe by some foreign power? If at all, it makes sense. Um, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a very uh, good question and timely. Um, look, the answer tends to be around, uh, unfortunately, it's, a lot of it's driven by, by cash. The, the investors want their money back, so they may push the uh, founding team to make it itself. Sometimes the founding team is their first company, and uh, you know the notion of putting some cash in the bank to pay for kids' college and to buy dresses is very attractive. So that, that also drives. Um, but what we are starting to see more and more of is the interest in, in, in building something bigger and holding on. So, so what some VCs, what some venture capitalists are doing now is as they're coming into later rounds of investment, they're allowing the founders to take some cash out of the company to de-risk playing the long game. So this is becoming a, a strategy in, in measured steps that is, is quite helpful. Another is to establish these partnerships that show a faster path to growth. Partnering with PwC or with a Honeywell for distribution. So we're seeing more sophisticated distribution strategies um, happening. And, and the, the idea of selling later, longer, for a larger <coughs> exit outcome is very much on everybody's mind. So it's, it's, uh, in Israel, it's certainly being addressed. Uh, another, uh, uh, maybe another uh, uh, um, uh, way of uh, looking at it is I think that it's not the same people who like come up with the idea that those entrepreneurs from Israel are not the ones who can manage and actually do the, the, the you know the corporate America uh, company. So even like if I look at myself building a company, <coughs> some size and in one point it would be smarter to you know to to hand to hand it to, to someone who can manage a bigger company. So so just to add to this, what you just said is a huge problem and it was uh, in recent years there's a joke that we should change the name from startup nation to exit nation. <laughs> and, and and one of the main reasons is that the market is not in Israel, the market is in Europe, the market is in the US, the market is in China. Each time you go into a foreign country, you have to spend resources, you have to deal with procurement, which is a big issue. You need to find somebody who's going to sell for you, who's going to market for you. That increases risk, that increases costs. Now, compare that with a big company that comes in and says, I'm going to give you a few hundred million dollars. So you sit to yourself and you think, hey, so what do I do now? Do I engage in three, four years of development and delay, conquer the Chinese market, or do I pocket some hundred million dollars? It's a different question. And, and 
Dov Nohan, who was the founder of, of M Systems that was sold for one and a half billion dollars, he said, I really didn't want to sell. I wanted to create the Microsoft of Israel. But you know what? There was so much pressure from all of my investors. I was afraid that the M System, by the way, developed a discount key. Right? I was afraid that somebody's gonna catch up to me. And once they catch up to me and they start competing and manufacturing in China and it's going to be much cheaper than my product, my company is going to go under. So you need to find this right time to sell when you're at your peak or almost close to your peak. He sold it for one and a half billion dollars and he said, I regret every minute of it. Because the problem is I think the startup nation requires two things to happen at the same time. You need the young person who's left the army with an idea, who's willing to take a massive risk, then he or she then has to marry it to the money and the coordination, but at least you have three together. But how can we go one step further, like a Kickstarter concept? Uh, yeah, I think that the, the first uh, thing is, uh, I don't know, start uh, um, you know, sharing your, your idea with others to, to, to start cooking it. like. Uh, to, to, to get the feeling if it's really a, like a good idea or it might, you know, once you start talking about it, share it with others, with your family, friends. Sometimes, you know, after a week, two, three, you might, you know, understand that it's not such a great idea and there are like others or whatever. But sometimes you, you say, wow, I, I might be like onto something here. And, uh, and yes, and then you, you need some seed money. So you might have your own stuff, you know, some some money, or like taking the risk, go to your friends and family, like I did, and uh, and, and and you know raise some some seed money, maybe I don't know, ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars, okay, to start, to have the first developer or the first guy to help you to start to build, you know, the the the, the prototype or whatever, or, or even you know. Uh, uh, have uh, uh, the, the, the first, uh, um, uh, I don't know, uh, presentation, whatever, to start showing it to others and to gain, to understand if it's really uh, uh, that, uh, a good idea. And if, it's, if it is, you know, it will usually be easier to, to raise, uh, uh, you know, the seed money from, from investors. Uh, but it, it takes time. But sometimes, you know, a, lo a lot of us, you know, uh, you know, fall into that trap that think, wow, I had this uh, great idea, and but we never share it with anybody besides, I don't know, our wife, and you now keep walking without. Yeah, I had this great idea once, uh, but I, I think like the, really the first uh, the first step would be talk about it, share it with others. Don't afraid. A lot of people are like, afraid to share this idea, so someone will steal it from me and, and will do that. Nobody will do that. You know, it's your idea. If, it's, if, if you believe in it, do it, you know, keep developing it and, and, and then you, uh, you actually do that. The, the other thing is there are various programs called incubators or accelerators. And there's over a thousand of them in the US. And an incubator or an accelerator is basically a team of professionals that what they do, they give you the education, they give you lectures, mentorships, and introductions. If you're good in, and sometimes a little bit of money. If your idea is good enough and you're accepted to an incubator or accelerator, you go through a four months, five months, three months program. Some incubators, you actually have a dormitory where you sleep there. And you sleep with many other entrepreneurs that you get to meet and talk about what you do and see if what you have is, is real or not, right? For example, in San Francisco, there's a specific incubator for uh, blockchain and Bitcoin technologies. <coughs> now, most of the people there are in their 20s, but there are people in their 50s there as well. So they live in this specific environment that teaches them what they need to know, okay, not everything, but what they need to know to get the business off the ground. And as I said before, it all culminates into a demo day. There's gonna be a big hole with, you know, 100 investors, 150 investors, companies, other, other folks who are from the industry, 
each company gets up, has five to seven minutes to present its ideas, this Q and A's, very similar to this, just with smarter people and more interesting ideas. <laughs> and those people sometimes get funded, sometimes they don't. But that's a reality check for many other companies. If you are not admitted to an incubator, you always consider having a co-founder, somebody who has a core strength which is different than yours. If you're a technology guy, look for a manager. If you're a manager with a brilliant idea but never wrote software, look for a technology guy. And ask for connections. People don't make connections naturally. Now, all of us know people with money, all of us know technology people, but it's not going to jump, jump into my head. If you tell me about your idea, I'm going to think about 10 people to introduce you to. This gentleman may not. He, he'll listen to you and say, okay, this is great, good luck. So you have to talk, you have to be proactive, you have to ask the question. Listen, I have this great idea. Do you know somebody who can help? And then you take it from there. Somebody once said that, that shy salespeople have skinny kids. <laughs> this is not a world to be shy. It's a world to be proactive, to be aggressive, and to push yourself. Um, I have a, a question about social responsibility. Where is the social responsibility to create manufacturing in Israel to raise the level of those people who are the worker people? So, you, you touch on a very, very uh, painful subject. <laughs> and I think, um, I, I think there are a few things that are happening now which are not really positive. The first thing we see, we, before we talk about exits, one of the big issues are that, that brilliant minds leave Israel and they live abroad. And once they're here, they pay taxes here and not in Israel. They sell the company, they sell it here and pay taxes here and not in Israel. And usually they stay here. So maybe Joe, after he sells his company for you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, is going to go back. Or maybe he's going to stay here and look for his next idea. That's a big problem. Secondly, um, I think the government in Israel today, and again, not going to politics, it, it promotes studying religious studies over science studies, which again causes a big problem. True. And the third problem, which you just recognized, and there are attempts in Israel right now to try and, and reverse that a bit. One of them, there are few social responsibility funds where each time a fund invests in a company, it requires to put 5% in another fund where the exit money goes to this fund and all it does donates the money for social causes. So there is a movement to try and fix that. There is a movement over creating creating specific funds to invest in orthodox Haredi businesses, to invest in uh, Israeli Arabs, and to try and, and keep part of the proceeds in Israel by requiring as part of the investment to be applied for philanthropic causes upon an exit. So when I say social responsibility, what, I'm actually mean, what I actually mean is, is there a way to, to manufacture in Israel so it can be competitive I, I think one of the ways is creating tax incentives, which is done in Israel. Eilat is a place where you pay less taxes in Be'er Sheva. There's an R&D center, you, let, you pay less taxes. Tefl in, in the north, you pay less taxes than the, you know, the company that uh, Berkshire Hathaway bought. So that's one way they're trying to do it. So it's a big issue. I don't know what the answer is. Maybe one of you guys. I just want to mention that, first of all, there are very strong uh, government programs in Israel. Then in terms of social responsibility, I just want to mention that there is a group called Israeli Venture Network, uh, which is a group that invests in socially responsible um, tech <coughs> companies, startup companies in Israel, and they do a great job. They invest in companies that have a so-called social ROI, not just an economic ROI, but there are ways to measure return on investments in terms of how many people got employed, uh, you know, do people with uh, disabilities got uh, jobs through that program and so forth. So there, uh, it, it, this group does a, a tremendous job and I urge uh, everyone here to, uh, to participate in it. Um. Two, I, I, well, it's, it's really two questions. Uh, I hear a lot about products, but not a lot about services. Is there an Israeli competition
to what we go through in the United States where companies are offshoring their technology departments to India. And the other question was, it was mentioned about uh, Israel being the one place in the Middle East that didn't have oil, but now we've got the Leviathan deal that went through with all these billions of dollars uh, for the natural gas. How do you see that affecting the startup and the technology? Is that going to uh, hurt or help? So I, can, I can answer like uh, part of the first question, but uh, yeah, we, we do uh, offshore and, 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 uh, and buy technology and, and programmers and developers outside of the U.S. For example, my company, the R&D center is in Israel, but we do have freelancers from uh, Poland, from India, from Croatia, uh, wherever we can buy those, you know, cheapest, uh, cheaper like developers. The core is in Israel, but we do uh, buy uh, uh, and, uh, and do some of the development outside of Israel to, to lower costs. And that's part of the part of the game. Uh, but if I regarding the, the, the previous question, so yeah, the government also give uh, if you leave the IP uh, of the company in Israel, in Israel, you get uh, you incentivate uh, incentives in, in terms of tax. It's almost like half the tax that you would pay here in the U.S. if the company is being sold or exit or uh, to an IPO. Uh, it's better for like a, a U.S. or like a outside investor to invest in an Israeli company, uh, usually like uh, or compared to like move the IP to, to the U.S. for example. Unfortunately, none of us really qualified to answer how natural gas will affect Israel. I think there there are big issues right now with uh, the government trying to try at least to implement a program that. The government gave tax breaks and it changed it much, right? So it tried to institute uh, uh, a tax law that basically predates the date it was enacted by the government that fell into litigation. So, so right now it's not really clear. The criticism is that it's basically governed by few big barons who are going to take advantage of that and nobody else is going to enjoy that. So if it's Hak Chuba, it's going to make a few more billions of dollars, it's not going to do any, anybody any good. The question, can you tax that, can you turn it into money, it's going to go back into the industry and into the ecosystem. You know, no idea. <laughs> Thank you very much.